separation of what's what I think we're on.
Good morning. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is David. I'm the pastor at Good News Church here. Uh, what a joy it is to see you here in person. Thank you for being so obedient and being quiet and not mingling. Uh, lovely to have you on the live stream if you're there. Let me just give a couple of notices. Um, so there's no Zoom coffee this morning after the service. So um, don't rush home in order to get online. Uh, do rush home or to, to bring someone back with you to your garden or um, perhaps if you're at home on the live stream, perhaps you can link up with someone there. Um, if you've not got anyone to go home with or to or whatever, um, then perhaps uh, when we're uh, after we've sort of sung our hymn, maybe there's uh, will be an opportunity to um, find someone and arrange to go home and have coffee with them. Uh, the other thing to mention is that uh, on Friday, this coming Friday at 7.30, we will have our discussion on The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. So if you've been reading that and would like to join with the discussion, then Friday, the usual Zoom details at 7.30. Otherwise, hear these words from Luke 1. Our souls magnify you, O Lord. Our spirits rejoice in you, our God and Saviour. For you have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. You have brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. You have filled the hungry with good things, and the rich you have sent away empty. Isn't that our experience? The Lord has been gracious to us. He has lifted us up. Let's pray. We praise you, O oh God, that we come to you as the weak and the needy, the, the broken, and you lift us up, you exalt us in Jesus. What joy it is to know you, to be raised up by you, to be seated by you in the heavenly realms. You are a glorious, magnificent God and we worship you. Amen. Well, last week in 1 Corinthians we saw that the big theme of the first eight chapters was that God is the hero, not us. And so we're going to start by singing if we're at home or humming in the building as we remember that... Uh, we rest on God. He is the true hero. So do stand and let's humble sing. We rest on thee.
to have a seat. We're going to come to a time of confession, and today I'm going to pray a prayer of confession, and then we're all going to say some words of encouragement and assurance to one another. We come to confession knowing we are right with Christ. He is our righteousness. But it's for our good that we do it. So there's a chance for us to confess our own sin before the Lord. In a moment, I'll lead us in a prayer of confession. Precious God and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you confident we can approach your throne of grace through Christ. However, we acknowledge and confess we are prone to doubting Christ's saving work. Our sin rises to condemn us and we question our own salvation. Please forgive us our foolish doubt. We are so prone to worrying, Heavenly Father. And you tell us that we don't need to worry because you will care for us. You will shepherd us and lead us and you have plans that are good for us, your people. Please forgive us our foolish worry. We are so often grouchy and grumble because we forget how good you have been to us. And we don't recognise that your discipline is for our good. We consider you less loving than you really are. Oh, please forgive us our foolish grumbling. We struggle, Heavenly Father, to put sin to death. And we love far too much the idols of our hearts. We Love, popularity, security, comfort, wealth, all these things, and many more. Please forgive us our foolish idolatry. And please give us the joy of knowing we are forgiven our sins, past, present and future. There is no more to pay. Give us faith to follow you rightly. Help us to be obedient so that we might make the most of wonderful fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And let's say these words to encourage one another. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Isn't that wonderful? Then you feel that, the, the joy of knowing as far as the east is from the west, as far as the High as the heavens are above us is his love. Let me pray a prayer of praise. Oh, we praise you, Heavenly Father. How could it be that you would care for us, that you would love us so lavishly, us awful sinners, and yet you do? Oh, you are a wonderful God, that you would fully, completely, as far as the east is from the west, remove our sins from us. Oh, that you would love us with the love that is higher than the heavens above and is too much for us. Help us to grasp more fully how, how amazing and enormous your love is. Help us to grasp how fully we are forgiven. And help us to walk in joyful obedience to you, we pray. Amen. 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 And we're going to continue in prayer and Hayden is going to lead us.
Just a few words of encouragement from Revelation chapter 21, just the first three verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God, and we praise you for all that you have provided for us, our homes, our families, the food we eat, and the freedom to be able to worship you without fear of persecution here in our own church. Father, we thank you that out of your great love and compassion, you gave us the amazing gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus, who lived and died and rose again for us, and our sins are forgiven, and that we might have everlasting life. As we humble ourselves before you this morning, will we ask for forgiveness for those things which we have done that have dishonoured your name? We are sorry for those times when we've not been courageous enough to stand up for you. Equip us, Lord, to be able to speak your name boldly in all situations. We pray for those amongst us who are unwell, troubled, lonely, or who are in difficulty. We especially pray for Dan, Shirley's granddaughter's partner who was involved in a serious motorsport accident yesterday. We pray for Steve, Dick and Janet, Rosemary and Phoebe, that you might graciously heal them. Thank you that we know that you are the God who heals us. Help us to seek out the lonely and be generous in our giving to those who are less fortunate than ourselves. We pray for our village and thank you for the beautiful spring weather that we're having. But we also pray, Lord, that we need rain. Um, farmers and many businesses that need rain are struggling at a time when it's very difficult for them. Lord. So we would love some rain, preferably at night. Uh, and we especially pray for our brothers and sisters who worship in other Hurstbeer Point churches. We pray that we may again enjoy the blessings of being able to share prayer times with them again in the future, as soon as it is possible. Lord, we bring our country to you. We confess that as a nation we have strayed from your ways. You have blessed us mightily in the past, Lord, and we pray that you will forgive us and turn the hearts of the people back to you. So there may be a desire to base the laws of our land in your holy law. Pour out your spirit, we pray, that the faithful remnant of praying Christians will see your kingdom rule today. We pray for our Prime Minister, government and opposition as they battle with Covid, the after effects of Brexit and serious financial concerns, that they might work together and above all, may your will be done. Lord, we also pray for our world leaders that they might work to protect our beautiful world and do all they can to share vaccines to rich and poor countries alike. We also bring to you, Lord, our persecuted brothers and sisters, and we pray that you'll be with them and strengthen them. May they know that whatever else ensnares them, they are always surrounded by you and your love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Good News Church. We thank you for the fellowship we enjoy with all our brothers and sisters. And we pray for David and his family as he leads our church forward. We read in Revelation 21 earlier that the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, the church, that's us, is the place where God will dwell forever. Father God, we pray that you will set our hearts on fire for you. May we not be lukewarm in our prayers and in our worship and in our witness. As the restrictions are lifted, 
for which we thank you, Lord. We ask that Holy Spirit will help us to grow our church with fresh impetus that it will truly be a symbol of good news to all, especially to the lost in our community. Father, we thank you for the saints that have worshipped in this church over the years. And we, we do thank you for them Lord, and the many blessings. But we also pray, Lord, that if there were misdemeanors or things in the past in history that may be holding back or stopping up the ancient wells, Lord, we pray that they will be unblocked and that the Holy Spirit will come and serve us here, Lord. Lord God, we bring these prayers to you and through the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
and he get hold of a Bible and turn up 1 Corinthians 9, and Wendy's going to come and read it for us at page 1150, Corinthians 9. Only one 
gets the prize, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Thank you very much, Wendy. Do keep 1 Corinthians 9 open in front of you, and let's pray. Our gracious God, we praise you for your word, and we praise you that you give life by it, and you equip us by it for every good deed. Please, um, please do work in us by your word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At my, at my school, we were posh enough in our school to have a, a pool table in our house. We had houses, that shows how posh we were. And in our house, we had a pool table, and you had to pay 50p uh, to play a game of pool on our pool table. That was our house. And in another house, they had a free pool table. Well, can you imagine how we treated those pool tables? Our pool table was, it wasn't revered, but it was kept carefully. It cost 50p a game. You wanted to look after that pool table. However, the one where it was free, well, it was very badly damaged within only a short space of time. There was something about paying for the games that meant we prized the pool table more. We tend to treat things better if we pay for them. And, and in Paul's day, it was no different. Paul had taught and led the Corinthian church as an apostle at their start. But then he had carried on in his missionary journeys. But the thing was that Paul didn't charge the Corinthians anything. In fact, he made a deliberate effort not to be a burden to them, not to charge anything at all. He didn't uh, ask for a salary or send a bucket around. He worked as a tent maker while also serving the church. And so when other church leaders came along, who, who as Paul's go on to say, rightly expected a salary, the Corinthian church got confused. They started to think that the other leaders who were, they were paying were more trustworthy, more valuable than Paul. Have a look at verse 3. This is my defence to those who sit in judgment on me. It's got quite serious, hasn't it? There are people sitting in judgment over Paul, the, the, the one who in many ways started this church off. And yet, um, the, the reason is because he didn't claim his rights. Paul is keen to say, that the authority of an apostle doesn't go up or down based on how much they demand. And so that's uh, the context for this passage, and I hope you have some background to it. Verses 1 and 2, Paul asserts that he is an apostle, and if he's an apostle to anyone, he should be an apostle to them, because they came to know Jesus through him. They started as a church through him. Verses 3 to 14... Paul demonstrates that he has a right to wages. He makes the case that all who bring the word of God faithfully have to have the right to be provided for. And it's worth saying that this still holds true today. Now, those of us who are in ministry have a right to be provided for. Now, churches which seek to pay their ministers as little as possible are not honouring God. It is good and God honouring to review my wages as we would normally do in a non-pandemic scenario. We'd be looking at my wages at some point in the year, just before our APCM usually, and going, is this a godly amount to be giving David? And just to be clear, I'm not making a plea here for more money. 
I'm just trying to do justice to God's word. Um, actually, we're doing doing fine at the moment, but um, it's a godly thing to consider how much to pay a minister. However, Paul didn't make the use of this right. Verse 15. But I have not used any of these rights, and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. Paul deliberately didn't ask for anything, very consciously didn't ask anything of them. And he goes on in verses 16 to 18 to explain one reason why. He says, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. So Paul gets some kind of a reward for preaching the gospel without asking for money. Um, And he doesn't really tell us what that reward is. It's very confusing, isn't it? He says, just this, that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. He considers that in itself the reward. We're going to come back to this later, because I think some verses later on help explain this. But for now, just remember, there is a reward that Paul gets by preaching uh, with, by not, uh, and not claiming his rights to money. But we're going to come to his, perhaps the foremost reason he doesn't claim these rights. And that's verses 19 to 22. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Here's the first reason we're going to see. Paul laid down his rights for the sake of the lost. Paul laid down his rights for the sake of the lost. Paul was so concerned that the Corinthians would believe, that they would hear him and hear the gospel rightly, that he didn't ask for money or food. He didn't want any barriers to the gospel. He made himself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So to the person who viewed food sacrificed to idols as unacceptable, Paul refrained from touching food sacrificed to idols. He lives as an Old Testament Jew to win the Old Testament Jews. But to the Gentiles, he lived in a Gentile way that he might more easily win them. Paul was ready to lay down his preferences, his desires, for the sake of the lost. Now, you may well have heard of Hudson Taylor, a great missionary to China. He had a similar approach to Paul. So in in Hudson Taylor's days, people going to China as missionaries would often have gone bringing, frankly, Victorian English baggage with them. They'd have gone going, you need to take on our culture to become a Christian. They went in their dress. They went in with uh, Western thoughts and said, you need to become like us to know Christ. Whereas Hudson Taylor took a different view. He said, no, I'm going to become like you. So he, he wore Chinese dress. He took on a Chinese name. He became as much Chinese as he could, despite being born in the UK, that he might lower barriers that people might come to know Christ. Paul laid down his rights for the sake of the lost, and Hudson Taylor did the same. So that's the first key reason that Paul laid down his rights. But there's a second reason, which is that reward we spoke of earlier. Have a look at verses 24 to 27 again. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? 
run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Earlier we saw that Paul considered himself getting some kind of reward for not asking for money. In fact, he seemed to say that not receiving that money was in itself somehow a reward, that not receiving it but proclaiming the gospel without it was a reward in itself. I think verse 27 shows us that what Paul means is that he didn't want to be disqualified from the prize of the crown that lasts forever. And so I think, as I understand it, Paul laid down his rights for his security. Paul laid down his rights for his security. It's probably worth us just working through what Paul is implying here. I think Paul is saying, if he had accepted money from the Corinthians, he might have been tempted to idolise money, or to adjust his gospel to that, or, or somehow to endanger his own spiritual welfare. Just to be clear, I don't think Paul is saying if he accepted money, that would guarantee that he would lose his eternal security. But I think he wants to put himself in training. He wants to do all he can to make sure he runs the race well. He makes, wants to keep his eyes fixed on that prize and the crown that lasts forever. So he doesn't want any temptations or, or idols or issues for himself to come up. And so it is for his own security, I think, that he uh, lays down his rights, his spiritual security. Do you remember the parable of the sower? Jesus says there are four kinds of soil or, or land that the sower sows onto. And of course, the, the ideal is to be the good soil, which hears, the, uh, hears God's word and believes it and produces a crop. Well, Jesus also speaks about the seed that lands amongst the thorns. And as it grows up, the thorns grow up and choke it. And Jesus, speaking of those thorns, says, They are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. I guess this is a warning, isn't it, from Jesus, that we just would be aware that Material wealth can be a danger to us. Paul was very conscious of that. He was serious about running the race well, and so he was willing to lay down his rights for the sake of his security. He considered it for his own spiritual benefit to not receive money from the Corinthians. So Paul laid down his rights for the sake of the Corinthians, for the sake of the lost, but he actually also laid down his rights for his own sake for the sake of his security. And the big point of 1 Corinthians 9 for the Corinthians is that they need to trust Paul. They need to trust Paul. That's what he's urging them to, isn't it? Trust Paul. He did all of this that they might hear the gospel and believe. He's so committed to his own eternal security that he was willing to lay down his rights. So trust him. He is an apostle worth listening to. They should trust him. They should trust him at, at least equally, if not more, than the other apostles who are expecting money from him, from them. And just as they ought to listen to Paul, it's worth saying that we ought to listen to Paul. Some scandalous things have been said about Paul's words in the New Testament. Paul does say some uncomfortable things, and we're going to come to some of them. Just wait till we get to 1 Corinthians 11. But we need to trust Paul. Paul wrote God's word. He was an apostle, authoritative, and so we ought to trust him, take him seriously. And just as we ought to trust him, we ought to trust preachers who take God's word seriously. 
We ought to trust preachers who are faithful with God's word. And that's regardless of how much we pay them. So my words up the front here are no less authoritative than when Mark stands up here and preaches from God's words. Just because you kindly pay me, but don't pay Mark, that doesn't mean that my words are more valuable than his. And added to this, we need to be careful of, of pastors and teachers, and be they in a local church or on telly or on the internet or wherever, who are asking for large amounts of money. Paul has said that we should pay ministers sufficient for living, but he hasn't said we should lavish on ministers vast amounts of money. The extra money doesn't make us more trustworthy. I think it's why we should be wary of systems in churches which pay uh, ministers who are more experienced or more qualified with more money. As a church, my understanding of God's word is that you should pay me what is right for me to live, what is needed for me to live with our family, if you possibly can afford it. That's your job as a church. And my job as a minister who is paid is to be a bit like Paul and to be careful about how much money I expect from you and how much money I demand from you. I don't want to hinder God's word going to you, or going to the lost. And I don't want to face unnecessary temptation. So trust Paul, and trust other faithful leaders. That's the, the first big application from our, our passage today. Trust Paul. Do seriously, take Paul's word seriously. Now, we'll come to some really difficult bits. In 1 Corinthians, and there are plenty of difficult bits in Paul's word, uh, words in the whole of the New Testament. But we have to take it seriously, and we have to take uh, seriously those who rightly handle God's word. So that's the first thing for us. The second thing is to take seriously Paul's example. Paul was uh, really clear. That he wanted to reach the lost, so he'd lay down his rights for them. And it was clear he wanted uh, to ensure his eternal security, so he laid down his rights for that sake. And so we need to take him as an example. We're not Paul, we're, we're not Jesus for that matter, but we are entrusted with the gospel. We have a treasure in jars of clay. And, and we are, are we serious? Are we serious about passing on this gospel to the lost? How serious are we? What will you need to lay down in order to reach the loss? What will you need to lay down in order to reach the loss? Let me tell you of John Stott. This is a relatively youthful John Stott. Uh, many of you will probably have already heard this. It's one of my favourite stories about him. Was that John Stott was a teenager on a, on a Christian camp. Uh, at, that, at this point, he wasn't a believer. And um, John Stott wasn't your average teenager. John Stott was into bird watching. Now, most Christian camps are about uh, you know sport or, or whatever, you know, active, excitable teenage boys, particularly, I guess. And there was John Stott wanting to go bird watching. Well, there was a leader who came alongside John Stott and did loads of bird watching through the week. That leader took John seriously. And so as the gospel was proclaimed, and as that leader had an opportunity to share, John took him seriously. That leader, uh, he may have been desperately keen on bird watching, but as far as we know, he wasn't. He laid down his rights to play football or whatever it was that was, was his cup of tea to reach John with the gospel. But I wonder, who are you hoping to reach for the gospel? Just for a moment, picture of one person in your head. I know many of us will have lists of people we are concerned to reach with the gospel. Pick one. Pick one and, and just get them in your mind's eye. What would it mean for us to take them seriously? What might we have to lay down in order to break down barriers? Perhaps it will mean 
uh, getting into a particular sport or TV series that we have no real interest in. Perhaps it will mean costly sacrifice in terms of, I'd rather see my family, but actually I'm going to make time to see that person. Perhaps it will mean going into situations which we find uncomfortable. Hayden was telling me about, um, I think it was some people in football management, who the team used to go off to the pub um, after a game or whatever, and these Christians used to not go. They used to go, we don't want to be part of that environment. But eventually they felt the conviction that actually they needed to witness to the football team. And so they did go to be distinctive. They went and had coke instead of alcohol. Well, it might mean going into uncomfortable situations. What will you have to lay down in order to reach the lost? I don't know who you're thinking of. But let's take this seriously. Let's, let's seek to reach them. Break down those barriers like Paul does. Let's take his example and follow him. So what will you need to lay down in order to reach the lost? And secondly, what will you lay down for your own security? This might well overlap as it did for Paul. Are there temptations that we're aware of that we need to be on our guard against? Are there temptations which we have every right to, but we need to lay down for the sake of our spiritual welfare? Perhaps it is in the realm of money, and we need to, like John Wesley, select how much money is wise for us to have and give the rest away. Do we need to be deliberate in our social media use and, and work out a way of ignoring the likes and hearts that come in because we're worried about idolising popularity? Do we need to get out our calendars and set aside time to do good works, whether they be reaching out to the lonely or assisting those who can't look after themselves or, or any other kind of good work? What do we need to lay down for our own spiritual benefit. If we're committed to following Jesus, then we need to be serious about our temptations. Just for a moment, just have a think. What perhaps is a temptation for you? It may not be very easy to come up with. Paul laid down his rights for the sake of the lost. He laid down his rights for his own security. So we do need to trust Paul and trust other faithful leaders. But what will it cost us? What are we going to lay down for the sake of the lost? And what are we going to lay down for our own security? Can I encourage us? We've not got a Zoom call later on this morning, but um, hopefully many of us will be going to some kind of coffee with others. Well, can I encourage you to start your time chatting by asking the question, what will it mean to be serious about reaching the lost? What will it mean to be serious about reaching the lost like Paul was? But let me pray for you. We praise you, God, for Paul. What a wonderful apostle he was. We praise you that he counted 
the loss so valuable, so significant, that he was willing to lay down his rights. And we pray to you that he was uh, really committed to his own spiritual welfare, his own spiritual security, and so was willing to lay down his rights for the sake of the crown that lasts forever. Please do help us to take on Paul's example, to follow him in that way, to be willing to lay down our lives for the lost and for our own spiritual benefit. And please do help us to trust Paul and trust other faithful leaders, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> We're going to uh, finish by hymning, hymning? Humming. <laughs> humming the hymn, um, Facing a Task Unfinished. Um, this is a, a version of the hymn which has a little chorus. I don't personally think the chorus really adds anything to the hymn, but I couldn't find a good version which didn't have it. Um, so it's got a little chorus, um, but it's, it's a hymn all about how we uh, laying down our lives for the sake of the lost and the need to reach the lost. Um, do join in, let's stand and sing or hum, facing a task unfinished. <coughs>
So a final prayer from Revelation 1. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, a wonderful joy to be with you, and God bless. See you soon. Thank <laughs> you.